device that's on the screen? Right? Okay, good. So this should be recording uh, the audio and the visual right here through this extremely weird Rube Goldberg machine I have set up over here. So uh, no promises that this is ever actually going to work, but at least we'll try. Uh, okay, so kind right, of some housekeeping stuff before we start. One more two grades were posted earlier today. Uh, if you checked right when they were posted for some reason, uh, there's a little bit, I don't know, check again because we had to, there's a little bit of weirdness that happened when we did the grading. Um, the homework two solutions have been posted, so you should be able to see those. And I've also posted on Blackboard these exact, uh, this exact practice, practice exam. So you should be able to go look at it later and you can either uh, follow along with what we're doing now to make sure you can do those same problems later or uh, kind of whatever you like. Uh, yeah. Have there been two coding assignments? Have those grades been posted? One of the homework, uh, project one has been, paid, uh, been graded, project two is still in the works because it needs to, it's a grading by hand where we're looking for various violations of did you uh, free every memory that you malloc, that kind of stuff. So it's a lot harder to grade. Any other questions on kind of class related stuff? Nope, none all right. Okay, so then we'll start at the beginning. All right. So there's no guarantees that the midterm is going to be exactly like this, or but there it will test obviously similar concepts, and they'll be at hopefully similar difficulty levels. Um, so I guess the other thing is, if you can't read that, you should let me know, and I'll try to press buttons until something works. Um, I have no idea if that's going to actually work. Uh, the first thing on here, read everything carefully, right? I feel like that should be kind of self-explanatory, but that's like general test-taking advice, right? Make sure you understand the question and what it's asking. So you just you read everything carefully, because if you do the wrong thing, then you're going to lose points. Uh, some statements can be tricky. It's not that they're intentionally tricky. We're not out here trying to get you, but you know, just like things can be tricky, so make sure you understand what you're supposed to be doing, when you're supposed to be doing it. Okay. Uh, can everybody read this? Uh, can I zoom in a bit? That's a good question. All right. Let's try this. Wrong way. How about now? Good. Okay. Earthway. <laughs> Problem one says, consider that we have the following seven regular expressions that are defined. So we have lowercase letter is defined as an A, a little a, a little b, a little c, or a little d. Uh, uppercase capital letter, all capital letters defined as either an uppercase A, an uppercase B, an uppercase C, or an uppercase D. Uh, we're defining digit here as five, six, seven, eight, or nine in numerals. And then here we have, let's say, four maybe combination uh, regular expressions here. So we have, uh, okay, so a couple things to notice. Uh, I'm using like a huge dot here. Anybody guess what that symbol means? Concatenate. Concatenate, right, yeah. If you just have the small dot, it ends up being incredibly small and really hard to read. So uh, if for some reason you have questions during the exam and it's not clear, raise your hand, ask. Uh, I may put something up here that just defines that, but it should be fairly straightforward that that's what that means. Okay, so we have alpha here, and alpha is going to be either, so we have a grouping here, right, with the parentheses, it's going to be either a capital letter, or a digit, or a question mark, or an exclamation point. And it's going to be followed by another group, so another parentheses, it's going to be followed by a lowercase letter, uh, concatenated with a digit and star. So zero or more of letter, digit, letter, digit, letter, digit. So it has to be a letter followed by a lowercase letter followed by a digit, but it can be zero or more of those, uh, finally followed by an uppercase letter. Yeah? In this case, you're using parentheses as, as grouping and not as actual characters that will be represented. Like, not correct. as actual six, right. The, the I, so these are pretty much everything we've been talking about before, right? So these are all the same symbols and everything. 
if there's something special, we'd say that, right? So like, if we tried to match a dot character, we would specifically say, hey, the slash dot name matches the character dot. It doesn't mean a regular expression. Catfish not. <coughs> yes. So that's so the uh, parentheses are just grouping. Okay. Questions on the regular expression alpha? All right. Checking five places. Okay. So now here we have the regular expression rho. And rho is a letter or a digit or an ex a question mark or an exclamation point followed by a letter or a digit, any number, zero or more letters or digits, uh, finally followed by a capital letter. Questions there? All right. Uh, then we have phi. Phi is going to be uh, a letter, capital letter or a digit or a question mark or an exclamation point followed by now we have a grouping, right? So we have a, a grouping here. So it's followed by zero or more lowercase letters, followed by zero or more lowercase digits, and that happens zero or more times. Is it, is it exactly the same thing as the one above it? Which one is this one? Possibly, I don't know, you tell me. And then we're ended here by a capital letter. Questions on that? Yeah. Um, if you do find one like five to six, where it it might be the same, I can't figure out a counterexample to it being the same. And you ask uh, which is it in? You know, if you give us a string and you say here are the rules, you would just pick the first one, right? So. Depends. So we'll look at it in a second. But yeah. So if in case in the case that you have you're parsing tokens from a string, right? And you have two things that match. Uh, if they match that entire input string and they're both the exact same length, then the precedence rule would apply. And so the ones that's defined first would match. Uh, so that's a good point, right? So I don't know. Can we prove that this does match? That this is identical? Maybe. Um, but I guess the real question is, if you do that and you're wrong, and you treat them as they're equal and they're not, then you're going to mess up, right? So uh, to me, you might as well just treat them as different things, and then we'll see how it works out, right? As long as we're matching correctly, it should be fine. OK, so this last one here, which everyone can see, good. So this last one here, omega is a digit followed by a letter, a question mark, or an exclamation point, followed by, once again, we have any number of letters followed by any number of digits, zero or more. Uh, all that zero or more times finally followed by an uppercase letter. <laughs> so questions on the regular expressions, what they mean, what any of the operators are for me. Yeah. All right. So now this is going to be, I just going to brought two copies. OK. Uh, OK, so now we're going to read the next question, right? So it says, for each of the following, fill in the blank with either uh, exists or is an element of or is not an element of. Uh, and so it's saying, recall that L of R for regular expression R is the language of R. Right? So what, these, what are these questions asking us, like semantically? Is, a, is whatever's on the left-hand side in the language on the right? Right, so remember we talked about a language, the language of alpha is the set of all strings that are described by this regular expression alpha. So we're saying, is this string, the string on the left, is it in that language or not? So how do we tell? Do we go generate this whole, all of these strings that are in this set? I mean, good, you're never going to finish in time, right? You may not ever get to that string, but. Could, but what's another way that this is? Uh, what's another thing that this is trying to ask us? Semantically. Yeah. Check whether what? Check the alpha. Check one of it. The expression of the expression of alpha. So yeah. So the other way to look at this is: Does this string match this regular expression? Right. We know if the string matches the regular expression, then this string can be generated by that regular expression, which means it's in this language alpha. 
right? So then the question is, does this, this string here, so capital A, five, lowercase a, capital A, is, is that a possible string that can be generated by alpha? No. No. So let's look at it. Um, okay, so we look first, we can see that, okay, this is an A, so we know that it is a letter, right? So that matches, it's a letter, digit, uh, question mark, or dollar sign. Uh, so we know that that matches. So we can move one over and say, okay, the next one is a five, right? So is a five a letter? No, no it's not. Uh, but we have a star here, so this is zero or more. So maybe that meant zero. And then so we say, is a five a letter? No, so we would say, so would we say that it exists or it not exists? Not exist. Exactly. Or I guess we could have more like that. Not too particular on here. Okay. Are you going to post the solutions to these as well? Uh, I will In case we don't like possibly post, I'll probably post, maybe I'll scan these, but there should also be a video of it so you can look at it. Okay, so for this next one row, so we're saying, is this same string, big A, five, little a, big A, is that in uh, this regular expression? So we have the letter here, right? The letter matches, then we go to the five. We say, is it a letter or digit? Yes. And then we say, okay, go to little a, is it also a letter, letter or digit? Yes. Uh, so then we say, okay, this next one, is it a letter or digit? No, it's not, but it is a capital letter. So it matches this letter, uh, so it does exist in the language described by Rowe. Point on that. All right. So then let's go. Okay. So now we have phi. So we have this other regular expression. We say, is this in there? So we have a. A matches the letter. We look at the five. We say, well, it doesn't match a letter. Right? It's not a letter, so that goes to zero. Uh, so then we look at this digit. It doesn't match a digit. Yes. Then we look at the next character. It's a little a. Does that match another digit here? No, it does not. But we have a star here, so we can do match this again. So does it match uh, one little, a little letter? Yes. Uh, then we go to the next one, and it's a big letter, so it doesn't match the letter. Right? So that doesn't repeat anymore. It doesn't match a digit, so that goes to zero. And it finally does match the letter at the end, so we can say that yes, this is in that language. I don't, I don't understand because I thought concatenated mean it, it. Oh no, star, star implies empty set. Yes, exactly. Star implies empty set, so you can yeah. Would it be easier instead of like let's write to look at the first then the last and just fill out the Could it be easier? Uh, yeah, yeah. And you kind of have to do it whichever way makes sense to you. Uh, you can kind of look at all of these and say, well, it's, it's got to be a letter at the end, right? Otherwise, it's definitely not going to be in. So that you can look at. And then you can look at the beginnings, right? The beginnings are pretty easy. The trick is just all about the repetition. So how do you yourself handle that to go through that? All right, L omega, the language described by omega. So here we have same string. So we look at omega. We say, is this a digit? Nope, so it doesn't match. So we can stop there. Right, so then this one's pretty easy by the same logic, right? We can say it's got to start with a digit, otherwise it's never going to match an omega over here. Questions on those four? Yeah? So we have not considered this the rule of precedence here? There is no, there's nothing precedence here. All we're asking here is, is this string in the language described by this regular expression? So these regular expressions are essentially independent, right? I mean, it's, so like for instance, this string here, right, matches in both row and fee. But that's fine, because all we're talking about is matching. It would be a different question if we said, if you have this string, what's the token that's returned? Right, because the token, we're thinking about all of the regular expressions at once. Yeah? Just to be clear, you can yes. say that there was a language R in which all these regular expressions were uh, yeah, so you could define a, let's say, 
Uh, if you really wanted to, you could define, uh, yeah, we could call it R, and we could say it's uh, alpha or rho or C or omega, right? And so that would match any regular expression that matches any of those. All right. So now we want to see, okay, we've changed this string a little bit. We've added a six in the middle here. So how does that change things? Uh, so for alpha, we see, okay, the letter matches up, great. Okay, we don't have a letter as the next character, right? That's a digit. So this has to be go to zero, zero or more repetitions. Uh, sorry, right here, uh, zero or more repetitions. And the next character is not a letter, so this is definitely not in that set. All right, and going down, looking at row. Uh, oh, and you can also see, so this is where you have to be very careful, right? So those have changed. Whether that matters or not depends on the languages. Yeah. So if we see one instance of like uh, alpha inside the uh, string given, would that be OK? Like, would that give us? What do you mean one set? Like, if you had AA in the first one, right? Mm -hmm. So then uh, letter and digit goes to empty set. And then there's other stuff after AA. Could we say that it's OK? So is the string, what are you saying, AA and then something yeah. afterwards, like yeah. two, three? Or one two or one two is not even in here, but let's say like AA five. Could we say that's included or alpha is included in there? So the way to think about it is does can this regular expression ever generate that string? No. Well if letter digit goes to M set. Oh well, yeah. It, it can't generate that exact string. It can't generate this exact string, right? Because it's gotta end with a letter. Right. Right? So But AA does. That nah, doesn't matter, right? Because that's like, it would be like, uh, does AA match a letter? Well, it matches the first part, right? right? I mean, it matches the very, and that's what we care about when we're talking about tokenizing, you want to think about consuming the input. But here we're just talking about, so letters only going to ever generate four strings, right? And all of length one, either single A, single B, single C, single P. Okay. And so those are the only four strings. So that defines the language of letters. And so when we're talking about here of matching or um, here, like, does it exist in the language, the question is, can that regular expression generate that string? Like, is that in that language? And so the answer here is definitely no, right? You can't have that string in there. All right, so just to be clear, not exist. Cool. All right, so we're looking at row here. So we say, okay, the letter, got the letter. And we say, okay, we have a digit here. And so we repeat, okay, we good. we've got another digit. And then we've got another letter. And then we say, okay, we have neither a letter, letter or a digit. And so we're followed at the end by a capital letter. So then we say, yep, that matches. That's going to be in there. So we have, for phi, right, so we have a letter, so that matches. Then we say, okay, letter, well, this isn't a letter, it's a digit, so that goes to zero. So we say, okay, yes, that matches a digit. It matches another digit. Uh, it doesn't match another digit, but we have a star here, so we can repeat again here. So then we can say, does this? Four is not a valid input. It's not a recognized character. Oh, recognized that's token. trickier than I thought. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> All right, awesome. Uh, de so yeah, it definitely doesn't exist then. Okay, perfect. Two, three. And the next Trying one is trick us. we've already done it, right? I'm just making sure everyone here is paying attention. So we call it a teachable moment. All right. Cool. So I didn't even need to. All right. So this one we've already done, right? So this one, Omega, that is the exact same one. <laughs> We could also go through it again just to prove. Okay, <laughs> All right. See, it's like a freebie, right? So, like, you know. But maybe hope. Uh, okay, so alpha. Alpha's good. So we look here, we see, okay, that matches a digit, that first five. Uh, then we see, okay, does it, it's only matching a letter followed by a digit. So is this a letter? No, it is not. 
Uh, so that letter, so that doesn't match. So this has to be zero, this number of repetitions here uh, in alpha. And then, so we say, was this five a capital letter? And the answer is definitely not, so, so it's not in there. All right, cool. And then we look at this, uh, let's see, same string for row. So we have the digit, and then we go one more, and we say, okay, well here we've got a digit, great. Uh, we can loop again, we have a digit, great. We can loop again. Okay, we've got a lowercase letter, that's great. And then we've got a final capital letter, awesome. So now we can say that that is definitely in that one. Uh, then we have the same string in fee. So we have five matches the letter, five matches zero of these letters, and one of these digits, two of these digits. The next character is a little a, it doesn't match the digit again, but we can repeat this. So I'm gonna say, does it match a letter? Yes, it matches the letter once. And then we have a big A, matches neither letter nor digit, but it matches capital letter. So we definitely in there. Awesome. And now we have omega, so we have a digit, so it matches this digit. Then we look at the next character, is it a letter, a question mark, or an exclamation point? No, it's not. So this is not in that show. All right, questions on any of those? Uh, you guys, you got what? Wait, you just want to make up one? So you're talking about this one? Oh, four is not a digit. Yeah, very tricky. All right. So now let's we're gonna go. get token repeatedly on some input string until the end of input is reached, uh, what the sequence of tokens returned is the following. So this is where we're specifically saying, assuming longest prefix matching, longest prefix matching is used, and ties are broken in favor of tokens that appear first in the list, right? So that uh, defines the precedence here, and also defines that we're using um, longest prefix matching. All right, so what does this look like? So what, we're gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by writing the string. Uh, so over here, we're gonna have five A, five big A, five, 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 big A, little A, four fives, and a big E. And then I'm gonna put the matching, and I'm gonna put the possible, and I'm gonna put match. Well, yeah, maybe this is match, and this is like longest. <coughs> longest. Very easy. All right, so now I'm gonna start parsing this. So now I'm gonna say I look at five. And so what matches five? Digit. Digit, exactly. So there's a set, it's gonna be a digit. Does five match any of these other? It doesn't match any of the other ones, but it's very false. Exactly. So that's the important point, right? So here in the matching column, we want to keep ma keep track of what matches exactly, like all the way through. Like that string that we've seen so far is in the language generated by that regular expression. And for right now, that's only digit. We've only ever seen that digit matches. Now the possible ones, right? So this is a digit, so it actually matches all of these. So we have, uh, let's see, alpha, rho, v, and omega. And the longest match up to this point is digit uh, with length one, right? So we've seen that it matches there. Great, all right, then we move on, we look at A, we consider five A. So 
So does anything match five little a? Does digit match? Do I carry over digit? No. Oh, because it doesn't match, right? It only matches strings of like one, so it's gone. Uh, maybe it helps to go through the possible. So now remember, we don't have to go through all of these that are possible. We already calculated previously what regular expressions we need to look at. So we can look at alpha. It does uh, So we have a digit, and then we have here uh, a, a letter, which does match, right? That letter's an A. So that means that alpha is possible. Uh, is it a match? No, because we haven't gone all the way through that string yet. So we look at phi. So phi matches the digit. And it's a letter or a digit, so that matches uh, the letter here. So phi is possible. Uh, sorry, rho. Then we look at phi. Phi matches the digit, and then it matches uh, one letter, so that's good. And then we look at omega. It matches the digit, and it matches the letter. So, uh, so we still have omega. And we have nothing that matches yet, and I'm going to put this for the longest match. All right. This means whatever the All right, so then we look at the next uh, element of the string. So we're looking at five. So we say, okay, it does, so we're going to create a matching set. We're not sure yet, so let's go through all these possible. So we look at alpha, uh, digit, letter, digit, digit, letter, digit. So yes, alpha is in here still. So we look at row, we say digit, letter, and then back around again, a digit, great. So we have definitely row. Uh, we have phi, we have digit uh, <coughs> letters, and then digits, so yeah, that still matches, or it's possible to match. We have digit, letter, and a digit star here. So this star goes to zero, this one matches one. We have the omega. Nothing matches, we're still here. And we get to here to the A. Oh, I don't know that yet. Okay, so. So I look at the alpha and I say, does alpha, mat, uh, has, does alpha match up to here? So we have digit, letter, digit, and then here we have a capital letter, so that matches here. So we've actually matched the whole term here. Uh, let's say alpha is matching. Uh, what about row, digit, letter? So a letter match, loop again, the digit match, loops again. There's a big letter, doesn't match either of these ones, but it matches here. So we have row. And then for phi, the digit, uh, letter one, digit one, big letter, doesn't match either of those, so we can move on. So phi also matches. And find the omega. Digit, letter, uh, letter zero, digit one, match one. Loop again, no. Big letter, so that matches. So all of them match. Uh, are any of them possible more? No. Is it some yes? I heard some no. It says yes. Yeah. Which, which can possibly match more input? Put input one more Put alpha where? This? You're saying this star? But remember, this last A matches this last letter, so we can't repeat that anymore. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to match it. All right, so none are possible. So which one is the longest match? Alpha. Why? Because it's first and precedent. So yeah, they're all the longest, but we already know that since there's a tie here, the precedence rule is going to go into effect. So it's going to say ties are broken in favor of tokens that appear first in the list. So that means we're going to have uh, alpha here with length of that one, two, three, four. Oh. And we have nothing more in our possible set, right? So there's no possible regular expressions that can match. So we know we're done here. We know we can say that this is our match, and it's going to be this uh, alpha 4. And then we're going to have the next part of the string. So we have, uh, all right, so we have, let's see, 5, 5, 5, A, little A, 5, 5, 5, 5, B. E. All right, so I start by looking at here. Look at the 5. Uh, does anything match the 5? Digit. And possible, I suppose, since we did this five up here, we could probably copy this whole row that you could also work through it, right? The longest match right now is a digit with like one. All right.
Now we look at the next character. So let's go through all the possibles. So alpha matches the digit, and then does this match the letter here? No. No, no which means this has to go to zero. But does this five match the letter? Also no, so alpha is no longer possible. Alpha is no longer ma matching. So looking at row, we have digit, and then we have a digit. So that's still matching, that's still good. Uh, for phi, we have a digit, and then we have uh, zero letters, but we have a digit here which matches that five, so that's still in the process. And the omega digit, and is this a letter? No, right, it's a digit, so uh, it does not match omega. So now we only have two that are in contention, rho and uh, phi. And the longest one we've seen so far is a digit. I just want to get my extra paper. third five, so we say there's none matching in there, so what are, is possible? So we only have two, right? Phi and alpha, uh, row and phi. So we just look here and say, okay, digit matches, digit matches, we can match a digit again, so row still matches, uh, phi, digit, digit again, digit again, as many times we want. So phi matches, good. So that's the longest. Now we look at this big A. We say, okay, does B match that? We have a digit, zero, a digit, a digit. Now we have a big A, which is a capital letter. Right, so we try, maybe try to loop this again. We can't, there's no letters in there. Uh, but it does match here, so we can put B right there. Or we can put row right there. Can you move it up a little bit? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Let's see. I think that's about where we are. Yeah. All right. So row matches, right? Digit, <coughs> digit, digit, big A. Uh, D, digit, uh, zero, digit, digit, uh, zero, or I guess one, it will repeat once. And then big letter in here. And then so which one of these is the longest match? <coughs> which one do we put in here? Row. 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 There we go. <laughs> what was that? <coughs> if row takes a precedence, what was, there's no relating point in looking at the next. Uh, row takes precedence, but it could be possible that um, phi matches longer. So row could match first, like let's say if there was something after P, after letter, um, then phi would be able to match it. But like in this case, there would be. In this case, well, in this case we don't actually know about what's going on here, if these are the same or not. But yeah, we could prove that to ourselves, then we could say whenever we see the phi in the row, we know that uh, row is always going to be chosen. All right, so we have this is getting tokenized now. Uh, now we have A. Do one more, and then we're gonna stop. Go on to another problem. Okay, so what matches the little a? Letter, letter. letter lowercase letter. Uh, we'll say nothing does yet. We kind of can tell. Okay, uh, what else could potentially match? Uh, can alpha? No. Rho? No. Phi? No. Omega? No. So nothing. All right, so now we know there's no more potential matching here, so we know we're done, and we know that the token that's returned here is letter. Um, so we know that that, so I'll just look at that here, up there, and. It's really hard to see what you're writing. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's so crazy. All right, 
So yeah, we've seen the A, so we know that the A, there's no more potential matching here, so we know we stop. We know that that is the longest match was a letter of length one, so we return that and we continue parsing the rest of the string. So that's where we go uh, continue doing this, uh, but we're not going to do that right now. So I think we should get on to other questions uh, so we can look at everything here. Uh, any questions about what we've done so far? Yeah. Um, are we to assume that there's like a, some sort of error token with the input that's like E is not actually a letter? Yes. So in that case, would we have an error token? Yeah, let's say that that would be put on there specifically. Huh. I may change that. Change it to a D because I can do that. <laughs> All right. We just have to go and rewrite history here. All right. Other questions? That's a good question. So it's safe to assume we won't pass it on the test. Yeah, and if there was something like that, you should say. And it does, if it doesn't specify in the question what to do in the case of an error, uh, then you should. But if you were doing that right, you try to parse up as far as you could to that error. And so you parse everything kind of up to there, because nothing matches that E. And then you would return an error for the E. But I would say that's not something I want to do. Yeah. Oh, so when you're looking for what else is a possible match, are you looking at the first set of all the Uh, Wait, what do you mean? That could match here? I'm sorry, just when you're starting with the string, I guess it's not just. I mean, possible? Like the possible sets. Um, and I don't want to draw too much of a comparison because there are different things, right? We're calculating first sets on non-terminals in context-free grammars. Here we're talking about regular expression matching. So basically, it's it's prefix matching. Like, is the prefix that we've seen so far is that in the language described by this regular expression? Uh, so that's what we're looking for there. So if it's not, then we know we're done. We can't, it can't possibly be that match that token. Uh, it depends on how many points you want. So if you get it, I guess that's an ambiguous answer. Uh, what I mean is, so let's say I messed up here, and here I returned digit mistakenly, right? So if I did that, I'd made one mistake, and I would, there'd be no way I would get this same sequence, right? Because it throws off everything else. Uh, so if you put, if you just put the right answer down, whatever, you can get full credit. I don't care. But but if you make a mistake on this first one, then it's going to cascade and you'll just get zero. As opposed to if you show your work, then we can verify, oh, you made a mistake here, but the rest of it is this is valid. So that way you can get partial credit for your answer. So I would say yes. And there'll be extra paper on your exam, so you don't have to worry about bringing paper. Uh, so you ask, ask the TAs if you run out. All right, questions? Other questions? All right, let's get to the other questions. All right, that was problem one. All right, problem two. Consider the following grammar. Here's the grammar. Uh, I expect everyone can look and see what that grammar is. So the first question is, find a string with two different parse trees and draw the two parse trees. So what do we do? Just look at this really hard and try to make something up? I mean, kind of, but there's other techniques too. Uh, yeah, so you look and try to understand. So what is? what are all the possibilities? Well, uh, let's see. S is kind of interesting. It has two choices here. S can either go to A, B, C, D, or just A. Uh, a can do. A's on the left, C's on the right, and any number of A's. A can also go to epsilon. Uh, B can go to little b, big B, or epsilon. C can go to A, C, or little c. So there's no epsilon in C. That's kind of interesting. D has to go to either big D, A, or little d, which then is also interesting. So there's no epsilon there, just from kind of looking at it. So I mean, one way to do this, if you want to do this crazy, like you could just, you can peek ahead at the second thing is asking you to compute the first uh, of S, the first of A, and the follow of A. So 
you can actually compute those, because if you can show that it doesn't have a predictive parser, uh, that could maybe help you figure out how to create that ambiguous parse tree. Uh, the other thing is we can start looking at parse trees and trying to think about well, what, what are the choices we have here, and can we kind of force these strings to end up the same by choosing rules differently? Um, so I think kind of one interesting thing is, okay, I think to me these two are pretty interesting. Like we have S goes to A and S goes to A, B, C, D. Um, so I'd try like an S goes to A. So here I can kind of eyeball this and see, I get an even number of A's followed by any order of CDs, right, the same number. So I'm gonna have some number of A's and some number of either C or D's on the right. Uh, so that could do, I don't know, A, A, C, and then this could go to epsilon, right? So this is one possible string in the language, A, C. So now the question is, can I get, can I create the same parse tree by taking, well, different branches in the tree? So if you look at this, well, clearly I can't because the only other option I have here is would put a D in the string here. So that's not going to help anything. Um, then I look, okay, well, let's start at the very top and just kind of see what I can do to try to get as close as I can to this string. Right, so I have S goes to A, B, C, D. Okay, so I have an A here, and I know, well, A can go to either A, C, or A, D, or nothing. Well, that's going to mess me up. Well, maybe it is, I don't know. I mean, one way we could try to match is we can go A, big A, little C, and this goes to epsilon, right? But now the problem is we have to evaluate the rest here. So we can look and we can say, well, let's not worry about Bs. Let's get rid of that. Uh, we'll look at a C and say, well, mm, I'm either going to do an A or a C here, like I have to choose something. So I can do like a C here. For D, I can do D. So here I have the string A, C, C, D. And here I have the string A, C. Okay. So some things I can tell by looking at this, right? What are some things you guys can tell by looking at this? Is that what we've done here? Yeah. What was what? There's an ambiguous grammar. Well, I hope so, otherwise this question doesn't make sense. And then this, this C in the middle, right, we could go A, 
big C, a big C, and little C. And these go to epsilon, this goes to epsilon, and we got a, a, oh, sorry, that's a small C. That actually looks surprisingly large. CD. So now I've got, so the string I have is A, A, C, D. And so I've got the string and I've got the. So, no, uh, so yeah, so I've got the string here. So this is the string. So remember, this is about, you've got to read the problem, right? Find a string uh, with two different part trees and draw the two part strings. Questions? So on the exam, you would play around maybe with the uh, grammar for the loss. So the critical recognition was that it must end with little d. Yeah, so you want to look at the grammar and try to understand what strings are going to be generated by the grammar. So you could try generating trees to see what that leads you. You can try looking at the rules to try and understand it. Um, yeah, those are all strategies um, to do that. Yeah. What is a definitive strategy? How would we program this, I guess? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, well, let's hope, I don't know. Maybe I have to look. Uh, yeah. I don't know off the top of my head, which is kind of nice because it means it's more interesting than calculating first and policy sets, right? Because you have to like come up with some intuitions. Um, but it could be that there is, like, one thing would be generate all parts trees, right? And see if any of them generate two different strings, but I don't know if that would terminate. Yeah. All right. All right, calculate first of S, first of A, and follow of A. Questions on what we're supposed to do here? All right. S A B C D. <coughs> Pen runs out of ink at exact that time. Okay. Right uh, okay. So they all we first all initialize that into the empty set. So. We have first sets now. What are we looking at? So we want to calculate first of S. Which of these rules are we looking at? The top two. Why the top two? We have S on the left hand side, right? Exactly. So that's those are the ones we care about. Um, so going through this once, we say, okay, we want to calculate the first of S. Well, in this rule, A is the leftmost symbol. So whatever the first of S is, I'm going to add that minus epsilon to the first of Sorry, did I say A? The first of A, whatever the first of A is, take that, subtract epsilon, add it to the first of S. There's nothing in the first of A, so that doesn't change anything. Um, and then I say, well, do I move on and add the first of B? And I would only do that if there was an epsilon in first of A. And I look at first of A, there's nothing in there, so that rule doesn't apply. Uh, and the same logic with this example right here. Right, so it's the same thing, A. So I can say that that doesn't change S at all, which makes sense because it's kind of the first grammar or first rule. I'll get first of A, and so I add the leftmost symbol. So I'm going to add the leftmost symbol minus epsilon. So here the leftmost symbol is little a. And what's the first set of little a? The set containing a, exactly. Uh, so we take epsilon out of there. It's not in there. So then we're going to add little a here. Do we go on? No, because there's no epsilon in the first set of little a. Uh, we go to the next rule, it also adds little a. Uh, we also don't go on. And then we hit the next rule and we see that, oh, a goes to epsilon. That means we add an epsilon to our set. Here. And there's no more a rules, so we're done there. Then we look at b. We say we add little b. Do we go on? Nope. We're done here. And then we add epsilon. We look at c. We add small a. Do we go on? Nope. Uh, don't go on, so let me look at the next one. We had small c. 
and there's no more C rules. So we look at D, we say add the first set of D to D. What's the first set of D? Empty set. Empty set. So we have the empty set in, does nothing. We say, can we move on? No. No, because there's no epsilon in the first set of D. So we're done there. And so we add little D. All right, are we done? Are these the first sets? Do it all over again. Do it all over again, exactly. Okay, now we look at S and we say, okay, let's look at this rule first. So add the first set of A, the leftmost symbol, minus epsilon. So we add A here. Then we say, do we move on to B? Yes. Why? Because epsilon is in the first set of A. Right, so epsilon is in the first set of A. That means we add the first set of D minus epsilon. So we add D. And then we say, do I move on and add the first set of C? Yes, if there is an epsilon in the first of B, which there is, so I add the first set of C, which is A and C, so A is already in there. And then do I move on to D? No. So is there an epsilon in the first set of C? Nope. So I don't move on, I'm done. And uh, then I also, I'm calculating S, so I also would go here and add the first set of A minus epsilon to S. So I take the first set of A minus epsilon is A, add it in. Then I say, can I move on? Yes. No, there's nothing after it. Can't move on. But is there an epsilon in all of these symbols? Yes. In the yes. first set of all these symbols? Yes. So then I add epsilon to the first set of S. All right. A, we can the eyeball doesn't change because it has non-terminals on the left. Uh, and the same for the rest of them, right? B, E, A, C. Well, let's look at D. Just to okay, so D, once again, we look and say, okay, add the first set of D to D. Well, it's little d. Great, that's already in there. Can we move on? No, can't move on. Um, so then we uh, don't add that A, we add the D, so that doesn't change either. All right, are we done? Do it one more time. Well, maybe one more time. All right, we do have to do it one more time. And we'll check again. Let's go around this trees that are. <laughs> All right, so we have the S. We're going to add the first set of A to the first set of S, which is A. We're going to add, then we're going to move on to B. We're going to add the first set of B minus epsilon, which is B. And we're going to add the first set of C minus epsilon, which is AC. Then we're going to say, can we move on to D? No, because there's no C in the first, uh, first set of C. There's no epsilon in the first set of C. Uh, then we're going to S. This S, S goes to A, so we're going to add to A again. And then we also add to epsilon, so that didn't change. Good. Uh, a doesn't change. B doesn't change. C doesn't change. D doesn't change. We're good. So we got our first sets here. Questions on any of those? Yeah. yeah. So, so you have the first of B. What rule is that? Uh, to where? <laughs> For the S, sorry. Like S goes to A, B, C, D. Yes. So I, <clears throat> so I add, so I apply rule three. So I add the first of A minus epsilon to the first of S. Because <laughs> that's the production term. Because that's, yeah, because that's rule three. Rule three says always add the less most symbol. And then uh, the question is, do I move over one? And rule three, uh, rule four says I can add the next first set if there's an epsilon in the leftmost symbol's first set. So there's an epsilon in the first of A, so I can add the first of B minus epsilon to the first of S, which is where I need to be from. And then I just do the same thing again. I say, does rule four apply again? Can I add C? I can if there's an epsilon in B. So I look at B, I say, yep, there's an epsilon in it, so now I can add the first of C. So I add the first of C, even though there's no epsilon there. Right? Because this rule is equivalent to, because A and B can both go to epsilon, right? this is equivalent to there being a rule S goes to A, B, C, D, or S goes to B, C, D, or S goes to C, D. Right? Because I know there's going to be some time where those go to epsilon, which means that this, these rules are kind of implicit in the grammar. So that's kind of the way I think about it back in general. Yeah. So the, the way that you, you finished off the first set of S was that instead of 
I think the proper way to do it is actually just rewrite the set for that iteration and then go through updating the rules. It looked like you just start off with an empty set on that very last iteration and you were just going through. Uh, yeah, it's one of those things I can't really show that it works exactly, but I'm pretty sure it does. But uh, I think it would. But yeah, you're you, saying, I mean, technically you, you you're copying this set over and, and then, then you're, you're adding everything. everything. Exactly. Yeah, so you could like apply the rules and then copy or apply it, copy it over and then start applying rules. I mean, in terms of like the project, that might mess things up because the input has to be exact. Like the output has to be in the same output. Because I think all of these values came from applying the rules all of these, like to all of these. So because like the sets are only growing, right? So at so here you're adding all these values based on these other sets, which means that later if you start with nothing, you're using these same sets which have definitely the same values that they had before because you're only ever adding to them. So I think we'd still create the same set. What if, what if there was like a weird rule where a, a first set was, to add, was added, something was added in the first set of A, like down the line, and then you would. Yeah, then you would I, add I, don't, I don't know 100%. Like so you should just use the same set. I think that's the same set, yeah. I'm a little confused. If C doesn't go to epsilon, why is S going to Where are you getting S? I mean, E or epsilon and S? Uh, oh, epsilon and S? It came from this rule. S goes to A. So oh, A can cool. go to epsilon, so that means S can also go to epsilon. Yeah. Sorry, but back to the same question I had. Yes. Like, rule number four says that E is an element of, like, say, A, B, it's not C. So basically, it would stop at B, and then it would get, it would add the first set of C into the first of S. So like, saying. I just, I'm just kind of confused on where you added the first of B to S. So rule four says there's something before, right? All of the ones on the left-hand side, there's some C's, zero through whatever, they all have epsilon in their first set. In this case, A is one, that C, zero, there's only one. And so we add B, we add the next one, we see, do C I plus one, which is I in this case is, uh, I plus one is B. So it just means add the next one. And you can apply that iteratively, right? So we're gonna apply it for when I equals say zero or i equals one when we look at one so we add this one and then we say can we can i be two then we can also add c so that's why we add c but then we say can i be three no because there's not an epsilon in these three first sets okay all right so we'll do one calculation of the follow sets, and then I want to move on because we have other problems to cover. I think those are more important since they're stuff that we didn't have homework on. Let's go to those. You want to go to those? Yeah, yeah. Can we just do those? Uh, yeah, we'll do that and then we'll come back here. about scoping, so, okay. Consider the following code in C syntax. So we're declaring a global integer, we're declaring a function g that has no input and takes in, uh, returns nothing. We have a function f we're declaring that declares a function i. Hmm. The tab didn't really come out there, I'll try to fix that. Uh, we're declaring a new locally scoped i, setting i to 3. Here we have in this block another i, setting i to 2. We're calling g within this block. And outside that block, we're calling g. In g, we take i, we add 1 to i, and then we print out the value of i for g colon space i. Then the main function, we set i to 5. We call g, we call f, and we return 0. So. The output of this program, assuming static scoping, so a normal C execution. So you should verify that you know right how to do this. So the way I would do this is I would go through this program, and because I know statically I can match up based on the scope where exactly the references match to the declarations. So I can go here and say, okay, we have the global I. Here we have a local I, so I know this I corresponds to that I. Right, because I can look out of the scope statically and I can see, okay, yeah, that maps here. And so I can look here and say, okay, this eye maps to this eye. So that's going to set that eye to two. 
I can look here and say, okay, what does this I map to? This one? No. This one? This one? Yeah, so both, all three of these eyes all refer to that global I. And because it's done statically, right, this is never going to change based on the execution of this function G. And then this I? Global. Yeah. So then, if I want to know the output of the program, right, I can just trace through execute it. Uh, so I'm going to keep here the value next to the declaration as to what that current value is. So here, when this executes, right, it's going to set this global i to be 5. And then g is going to execute. So we go into g. We say take i, add 1 to it, put it back. So it's now going to be 6. Then we're going to print out i. So it's going to print out g colon 6, and then a new line. Uh, then it's going to, g is going to return. It's going to return here. Now we're going to call into f. F's going to set this i to be 3 right here. Then we have a new block. We're setting this i to be 2. We call g. We go down here. What does this i refer to? The global, right? Static. It doesn't matter. Right. So this is going to update it to 7. It's going to print out g on 7. And now we have, we leave this block, and we have another call to g. And now which one? So it's going to update this to be 8. And it's going to print out g on 8. And then this f is going to return, and then main is going to return. So the output, assuming static scoping, is g seven or six seven eight. Makes sense, right? It makes sense because it only matters how many times each time g is called is going to update the global i. So with static scoping, this binding of this name i here to the declaration is done statically at compile time, so it doesn't matter where G is called. All right, so is now it's dynamic. So, questions? Is this ever not a really terrible idea to do in actual coding? Uh, it can, so, it depends is the short answer. There's some times where, uh, like, global, where, so dynamic scoping is essentially every variable is global, kind of. Uh, it can be nice because you can allow functions that call you to change your behavior just by setting variables which can be nice, but it makes it really difficult to reason about the behavior. No, I, I'm saying more specifically, like, just only using one variable. Oh, uh, oh in fact, no, of course not. But it doesn't demonstrate the, what we're trying to do. Well, no, I, I understand. <laughs> but, yeah, OK. So the second part of this question is the output of the program assuming dynamic scoping. So I'm going to go back up here so we can look at the whole thing. Uh, but I'm going to put dynamic. <laughs> Okay, what would the output be here? So I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to go simulate the execution, but I'm going to keep track here. I'm going to keep track of the current stack, of the current symbol table. So when I'm executing the function, I first have this global i. And at this point, I really only care about i, like the variables. I don't care about the functions. I won't. There won't be any weird cases where like functions change to new functions being called or locally defined functions. Uh, so i is being declared, it has no value. We get to main. Main sets i to be 5. So instead of statically knowing this, right, we look it up in our symbol table. And we say, OK, setting the value of i to be 5. And then we call into g. So we call the g. g says increment the value in i. So there's only one i that's been declared so far. So it has to be this one. And so we increment that to 6, and we print it out. So we do g colon 6. This g returns. Now we call main calls f. So f gets called. Now this new block creates a new i in this block. And it sets this i, sets i to be 3. So it looks it up in here. OK, this is definitely 3. Then we enter this new block where a new i is declared. And we're setting that i to be 2. Now we call g. So we go down into g. g says increment i. So which i does this refer to? The, the, most recent. the last one, the one that has the value 2. So we're going to increment that, put 3 in there, print out 3. So it'll be g colon 3. Now this g returns. 
And so now we leave this, so this I, remember, has block level scoping. So this I is only valid in this block that it's declared in. It can be accessible by any functions that it calls that reference the name I. But once we leave this scope, now this I goes away. Now we call this G. So what's the value of the I that this G has? Three. Exactly. So this is called, it's incremented before, G colon four. It's like it's incremented. And it returns. And then F returns. And then when F returns, do this, and then we return zero. So the output here is uh, six, three, and four. Questions on that? Yeah. Uh, with the dynamic and static scoping, does the drawing of a Fortis kind of like point and get it wrong? Like how are you thinking? Is that what you're saying? Uh, you, if it was very clear about your thought process. Um, yeah, you you would want to write more information about why, like, so that's the problem is this is a dynamic process, right? So if you just had this, it'd be hard for me to give partial credit on this because I don't really know what it means. Because if you messed up, it would depend on which I you were accessing at which time. Um, so if you, maybe if you like labeled these and were like, this I goes away at this point or something like that, it'd be better to just get it right. Uh, okay, so that's this question. Last question. All right, problem five. Consider the following C code. So we have two global int star stars, P and Q. We have a main function. This main function declares an integer uh, pointer A. And then in the new block, we have an integer pointer B we're mallocking a new int uh, to point to A, and we're setting that equal to A. And so over here on the right, this is saying that that memory's address, you can call it one. So that's what this comment means. Because when you need to put a value in somewhere, you can call it one. Uh, then we have B is equal to, we're mallocking a new integer for B. We're then we're doing star A is equal to 42. Uh, this comment defines a point in the program, which we'll refer to later. Um, then we, we're mallocking a new thing, assigning it to B. We're doing star B is equal to star A, and we're assigning P is equal to the address of A, Q is equal to the address of B, and we have a new point. Okay. So we also have this <laughs> assumption here, right, which is important. Uh, so assume all uninitialized pointers are equal to null. So if you had to draw a box circle diagram, you would put null in the value of pointer. So if I had a point, let's say this right here was point, point 0.3 and I said draw the box circle diagram for A and B at point 0.3, well you have A bound to a box with a value and the value in there is null. Same with B. Now you normally can't assume this, but because we have this assumption here, this is what we need. Questions? All right. So draw the box circle diagram for A and B at point one. So what's happened so far in the program? So A is, I didn't update this. This should be more complicated. OK. Uh, a should be, A is going to have in its value, so OK, first we know we have an, some A, some B. And we know that because they're declared here, right, they're bound to some location. And that location has a value. Right? OK. So here, at this memory allocation, what does malloc do in terms of box circle diagrams? Yeah, so it creates a location for us, right? So it creates a location somewhere which has, an, let's say, an uninitialized value. It doesn't really matter at this point. Uh, and what's the address of this location? One? Right, because it specifically says it here. That's why. 
Normally you would know you could use something symbolic, that would probably be fine. But if it says it here, this is what this is what this means. Okay, so then so then we have this assignment, right? So we're returning uh, an R value here from malloc, which is the address of this location that it just created. And we're assigning that to A. So what are we doing there? Taking that R value and copying it where? Into the value of the location associated with A. Right? So we take that, the R value that malloc returns is 1. We're going to take that value, we're going to copy it into the location associated with A. So this is the location associated with A, and the value in the location associated with A is the circle. So we take 1 and we copy it into the circle. Then we look at B, and we do the similar thing. So we know malloc is going to create a new box. Uh, which is a location with some value in it. And so we know that it's going to be memory location 2. And by the same thing, we know this assignment semantics is going to take 2 and copy it into the value of the location associated with B. The thing that's not on here, um, well, OK. So then we get to here. So what is this, the semantics of this operation? So what's 42? R value or L value? R value. Right, because it's just a value. There's no location associated with 42. So 42 is an R value, so the semantics are copy that value, which is 42, copy it into the location associated with star A. So what's the location associated with star A? One. one. The location that has the address one. So we can copy that in there. So then we put 42 in here. And we're at point one. So do, is there anything in here? No. You have either null or nothing in there. Uh, that's either way it's fine. So the other thing I didn't write here, but let's say there was, uh, if it was A, B, and it said label A star, B star, uh, let's say with arrows. Right? So then you'd take, you'd say, okay, I want to label A star. So what is, where's A star? What's the address of the memory at A star? One. Uh, one, right. I guess it should be star A. Okay, keep doing that. okay one. Right, so then we're going to draw an arrow from the value inside one to the box <laughs> whose name is one, and we're going to label that star A. And for B, same thing over here. All right, questions? Yeah? Um, at point three, when you, when you declare uh, A and B, yes. um, considering P and Q to be global instances, like, wouldn't their box diagram be represented as well? Because if I asked you to draw them, so like here, it's, I'm just saying if, I, if you had to draw A and B at this point, this is what you draw. If I wanted you to draw every, I'll, it'll be, should be very explicit, like, I'm going to update these. So I want this one to be P, Q, A, B, uh, like star P, star Q. Oh, it's almost time. Yeah. OK, so it is time. All right, and so the second question is how to draw this box circle diagram for P and Q and A and B. So you go through here, all this execution. A uh, big thing is in here. Um, so you have to see that the new memory is being unlocked at location 3. Uh, so you'll have A, B, P, Q. Circle, circle, circle. If you need to leave, you should probably just leave and then you can look at the video later. Okay, it's working. That's an option. Um, uh, can I what? I don't uh, there's only so much I can go. Okay.
So a couple of the important things here. We're mallocking a new, uh, new piece of memory here. So malloc is creating a memory with address 3. And we're putting that address in D. So that's why 3 is in D now instead of 2. And this next line says whatever's in the value associated with star A, which in this case is 42, take that value and copy it into the location associated with star B or copy it into the value of the location associated with star B. So star B is this box here, this location, and so this 42 gets copied over here to this 42. And then, so there is no, we don't have any addresses of A right here, so I'm using the address of operator here. Uh, you could give A and B symbolic values, like X or Y, yeah. You wouldn't have to keep memory to this like uh, you wouldn't have to keep it floating, no. It's not too uh, The question is, would you have to draw like a box here or a material that I've done? No, you don't have to draw it. Just whatever is like, associated with it. 